Today we are going to be doing a scene from the Nativity, and so we'll be doing the Three Wise Men. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, before we jump into painting, doing a drawing after Peter Paul Rubens, his Nativity painting, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Three Wise Men. So it's really interesting, um, if you ever think about it in, in the Bible when it talks about the Three Wise Men coming um, to visit you know, Jesus because he was going to be born in Bethlehem beneath a star. Um, how did the three wise men know that? Who were they and where were they from? Um, I don't know much about this. So maybe there's, you know, there are scholars out there who could speak about this at length. I'm not one of them, but I just found it really interesting that outside of Judaism, um, that you had people who were from the Far East. So where would the Far East have been? I, I don't know the answer to that. Could it have been Persia, which is modern day Iran? Could it have been Iraq? As we jump into this um, drawing today, um, I wanted to go specific on the faces and the body language. As I, as I start this drawing, um, I'm going to look at the reference picture and I'm gonna really study the reference photo so that I can figure out, okay, how am I going to mask this in and then how am I gonna go into some detail? So we're not gonna be able to draw every character here, but as we work, um, we're gonna do the geometric essence idea that we worked on in a previous lesson. So if you watched my video on the Thanksgiving Day Feast and about reducing everything to geometric essence, then you'll remember um, how we took that with Norman Rockwell and we did his Thanksgiving dinner and we just kind of like broke apart the compositional devices. So this right here would be Mary. And again, I'm gonna flip back and forth a whole lot between the different cameras. And you can see how I've summarized her right here. I'm flicking back and forth. And then I'm gonna go on to the baby Jesus. So Jesus would be right here at the base. And there is Jesus down here. And he is tiny. And I'm gonna probably just leave out his legs for the time being. And I'm just going to put in kind of like a square representing like both legs. So now I'm moving on to the figure that's leaning forward and looking at the figure of the Christ child. So what is so amazing to me about um, the story of Jesus being born as we you know, are so close to Christmas now, what's so amazing to me about this story is all of the prophecies that came um, through the writings of Ezekiel, of Isaiah, all the different authors who spoke about you know, someone who was going to come and in the book of Isaiah, it talks a lot about how when Jesus would come, that there would be nothing in him, no form or comeliness that would like make us attracted to him. Um, but that he would kind of like the thing that would be interesting is that he was going to come without any particular beauty, without any particular grace. And so I do like this painting because um, in this painting, we don't really see Jesus as necessarily being this super baby that like is, I don't know, extraordinarily beautiful. He, to my eye, he just looks like a, he looks like any, any other baby, like kind of like a cute little thing. And I just, myself personally, these are significant things to me because I think Rubens has done a great job of rooting the, you know, the, the Messiah as he read in the book of Isaiah, rooting it in kind of like common, like very accessible features. So I like that a lot. Um, I'm definitely inclined towards European, what I call naturalism. Some people will call it something different, but I'm gonna call it naturalism, where it draws very much from the idiosyncratic common features that we see um, people having in the day-to-day -day around us. It's not so much, if you think of Greek painting, uh, Greek painting could be very much based on the ideal and Greek um, um, sculpture, I'm sorry, could be based very much on the ideal and Greek painting 
uh, I'm sorry, uh, enrollment sculpture could have like all like, like very like common features in it. So I like to talk about this a little bit with the ideal and then the realistic. The Greeks, it's really, I really have to abbreviate this whole thing and say, when they were painting the ideal, when they were sculpting the ideal, um, they were going for an essence that existed a, far out above and beyond all of us. So it was an ideal. When the Romans came along, they took the Greek ideal and then they kind of brought idiosyncratic features that were like day-to-day -day features that all of us had. So the term warts and all, we're told, comes from the emperors who'd sometimes like, let's say there's a wart on some nobleman's chin or something like that. They'd say, I, I want myself sculpted warts and all. Like if they had a big fat jaw, they didn't make it beautiful like the Greeks may have, but they actually sculpted their emperors with these massive powerful necks and just like grumpy guys. And then they distribute the statues of the emperors throughout all the Roman territories to let the people know who was the emperor, who was to be venerated, who was to be feared, you know, as per the Roman government. You could say, why am I saying all this? Well, because when you go to draw and paint and you're looking at Rubens, Rubens is taking something from the Greek ideal, because he does draw something really beautiful outside of it. He takes something from the Roman realism and he smashes them both together in this form of naturalism in the, in the, beautiful period that Rubens was in. So like, um, I like to understand different art periods and understand what's going on in the Renaissance, understand what's going on in the Baroque, where they're kind of fusing all these different things together. Very, very different than a high Renaissance period. So as you look at this right here, I'm trying to just pay attention to the big broad shapes. And as I pay attention to these big broad shapes, I'm now ready to go into some of the particular details. So when I go over to details, what I'll simply do is I'll oftentimes get like a shorter, I mean a, a sharper pencil, and then I'm ready to go for specifics. So let's say we can't get all the details everywhere here. Um, so what we're going to do is we're gonna choose a couple of faces, like two or three faces, and we're gonna get a little bit more detail in those. So let's look over here and we'll pause and we'll look at the face and we'll say, okay, here we are. There is the bottom of the nose and then there is the slight incline of the front of the nose and it comes forward. So my early drawings stay very, very geometric. I do that on purpose. And the reason why I stay so geometric is because I wanna think of like the outside form of something and I don't want to stay, I don't want to get too committed to tiny little pieces of information um, that are going to distract me from the broad overall. And so there is the hairline right there. Um, I'm aware that my, my drawing of Mary is gonna for a long time look like really um, harsh and oafish. Um, I don't care, it's, for me, it's, it's fine to have something that is really angular for a, a while, and then later on I can return to it and try to find the thing that's really, you know, the, the specific passages, the gentle turns of things that bring in like that grace or that bring in that beauty of something. So that is my summary of the face of Mary right there. Really, really basic really simple. Um, so then I'm going to quickly gesture in Mary's body right here. There is the top of her shirt. There is her shoulder right there. And there is the back of her arm. So if I hadn't spoken to you about what was going on with like the Roman art, the Greek art, you wouldn't understand to the quite same extent what's going on in this piece right here, where Rubens was amazing because Rubens was the product of a school of painting that really loved working from life itself. And by saying he painted from life itself, there were schools of painting that existed before Rubens, um, which were in short, they, they heavily emphasized not necessarily drawing or painting from life itself, but they 
they had like books, almost like in the same way that we have stock photos. They had books um, that would have the head of like, let's say a person crying, uh, the face of the mother Mary, the face of this, the face of that. Like, so they would have like stock books, much in the same way that we have websites with stock photos. And I'm just gonna zoom in on this just a little bit so you can see it with a bit more detail right here. And Rubens it was incredible because he was of a different school in the, what we call the Northern Renaissance and then it later on became the Baroque. Um, but he was of a different school in that he loved working actually from life itself. And when you work from life itself, you can get like, let's say like the chubbiness of this arm right here. You can see the chubbiness of that arm and you can see how the flesh kind of like doubles up on itself for this little baby right here. So that's kind of like enough information for the time being. Um, I'm gonna roughly mass in, let's say the hand right here. So the hand as it turns right here. I'm going to roughly mass in his feet right here. And again, I'm keeping everything as just basic geometric essence. I do not want to get caught up at all on Jesus' cute little toes <laughs> as a baby. Um, that's just not what I should be focusing on at this moment. So Jesus' hand is being dipped in this, in this little um, golden bowl right here. It almost seems like it's like, almost like a foreshadowing of like, maybe of like an anointing or a baptism. And keeping it very geometric and angular. Some artists, um, I think it's important for me to say, uh, some artists don't work this angular at all. Um, so when I work with students, I like to let them know what I've inherited from artists that came before me, and then what I myself have come up with. This is just a way that, this is a way that I work, but there are many artists who I've come across, um, oftentimes they're online, and they say this is the way that the old masters worked. Um, and they come up with like all these ways of working, and then they pretend as if their way of working is the way that the old master worked. Um, I don't like doing that, and I, and I won't do that. Um, I did obviously have formal training at the oldest atelier in Europe, so it's the Charles Cecil Studios in Florence, uh, but at no point in time did we ever review, you know, like the compositional lay-in devices of Peter Pearl Rubens, who was up in, in Holland. In, this is my approach to massing in as I look at his work. So, okay, so you can see now how we're getting kind of like the eye socket of the one wise man who's holding that golden bowl. And so here's the eye socket and the nose right here. Uh, we can even go in and we can zoom in on the eye itself. Um, so I got the angle wrong, wrong there. I'm gonna try that again. And there's the angle right there. And I'll even at this point put in an individual eye. So if you remember I said just before um, that we weren't gonna draw every face in detail, but we were gonna choose a couple of faces to really zero in on. I like this moment right here. So in all likelihood, I'm gonna focus all my attention right here soon and really try to, you know, like really try to push this along. Okay, so he has this awesome beard that I really love. And the mustache comes all the way down to here. I love Rubens's work. I love his paintings. Rubens was a teacher who also, he was, he taught one of, another one of my favorite artists, Van Dyck, and they had a workshop. And in this workshop, they produced magnificent um, 
enormous like altar pieces and things of that sort. And Rubens and Van Dyck, their work became, Van Dyck was such a great student that at a certain point, it's hard to tell what was painted by Rubens, what was painted by his student Van Dyck. So I like how this is going right here. I feel like this is a really tender moment. Um, and so I'm going to put the bottom of the golden chalice in right here. And then I'm just going to allude to that hand. Holding the chalice. And so again, seeing the hand as being almost just like, it's almost like a cube in a way. So maybe I'll jump up, up here to hint at the face of this other man right here. So again, um, I was impressed that uh, somebody wrote above, I think it was Daniel, um, wrote um, Persia with a question mark. And so we see this face right here of a man, and it's a really beautiful complexion. The skin is, is bronze, and it's a really, just a strikingly beautiful portrait. And I think, in my personal opinion, it shows something really tender that Rubens uh, had towards an individual, you know, who, like, let's say, is from, like, the Persian area. Um, this is not a caricature. This is not, like, some stock image that he just got from some book somewhere. It seems to me like he actually had someone who was of this, like, from this part of the world. Looks like he almost had, like, a model come in and pose for this, because how else would you get just these really amazing, believable flesh tones? Is it possible that he could have made it up? I'm sure it is. Uh, do they have trade routes that could have opened up that kind of, like, you know, cross-culture where they could have had people from the region of Iran? Um, don't forget that when the Europeans when they wanted to paint with gold, uh, with a uh, blue paint at this point in time, oftentimes one of the paints that they would use, it wasn't every blue paint, but uh, one of the paints was lapis lazuli. And lapis lazuli is an interesting color because lapis lazuli actually comes from mines in Afghanistan. And the mines in Afghanistan, uh, they had this stone called lapis lazuli and the stone would be ground up, pulverized, and then it would be like suspended in oil or in another vehicle. Um, and then that would be used for the color blue. So again, it wasn't every color blue used in all oil paintings, but they did use lapis lazuli in plenty of works such as the Sistine Chapel. So isn't it interesting that in the Renaissance, the color blue had to come all the way from mines in Afghanistan and then were transported to Rome to be used in the Sistine Chapel. I find stuff like that incredibly interesting. The other spot on planet Earth where lapis lazuli comes from is Chile, the South American country. And I know that because I lived in Chile, and we, got, we had a chance to go to the area of the country that had lapis lazuli mines. And so it's, I believe there's only two spots on Earth that have lapis lazuli, and that is Chile and Afghanistan. Okay, so I've, I've masked that in uh, pretty broadly. I do want to mass in this other face right here. Um, one of the reasons why I want to mass in this wise man looking on is man because his profile is so great. This is a really wonderful, naturalistic, realistic profile. So if you walk away from today's lesson, I hope one of the things that you say to yourself as you walk away from it is, hey, I learned something about the, the Greeks and the Romans. I learned something about um, the, the ways in which, the way in which the Greeks we're alluding to like this ideal of beauty that was like almost like beyond this world. If you think of the statue by the Italian artist, Michelangelo, the Florentine, if you think of 
Michelangelo sculpture of David or of the Pieta. Um, and you can ask your parents if you can look these things up. If you look at his sculpture, um, he, paint, he sculpted the ideal. It was like a beauty that was beyond this earth. It can't even exist, it's so perfect. But then if you look at the work of Rubens, it's not so much that ideal. I mean, it has some of it, but it's like you could almost, if you look at the image right here, in a way, you could almost see that guy. Um, I used to work in construction when I was younger, and I swear that there was a guy on a construction site that could look exactly like that with this awesome beard. And I feel like that's someone who's like approachable that you can know, and yet it's also incredibly cool looking and beautiful. So like the ideal and then the, the realistic. And so you guys are learning that today. And I'm going to mess in the shoulder. So I had said that we were going to go back to um, this one scene, like right down here. And to do that, I'm actually going to pull the paper up just a little bit more, place it right about here. And then I'm going to zoom in even more so we could just get some nice, like detailed shots. Um, I like to give you guys like as close a possible look at the specifics of what I'm doing so that you can really um, you can follow along as you know as best as you can so all right I'm just putting a little bit more blue tape on either side to just push this down and here we are back to the drawing okay now I'm gonna get a really sharp pencil out and this is incredibly sharp this is a 6H pencil um, because I, I do want to get like really specific on this. And so if you look over at, this is the close up of what we're, of what we're drawing right now. And now I'm going to jump over here and I'm just going to start going in with some specifics here. All the detail, all the, the features here, they're really delicate. I have my little eraser, my automatic eraser, right here, because this eraser is nice for erasing in specifics. And I'm going to get the ear right here. Now, as, as I work on my drawing, what I'm really sensitive to is taking these straight lines and making these straight lines, um, bringing in more straight lines to make them curved. Um, I, don't, I don't work this way all the time in drawing in that I will draw curves in, but when I'm really trying to be accurate and specific, I'll put in a lot of straight lines, and I, as I introduce more and more and more straights, the thing starts to curve out. And so that I call stop signing, and it's such an important concept that I think I'm gonna pause for a moment, grab another piece of paper so I could uh, just demonstrate this very quickly for you. And I'm going to show you stop signing on here just very quickly. So stop signing is where um, it's a term that I came up with. It's not like, you know, a term that you'll find in an, any art history book or any art instruction book. Let's say you want to make a circle. Um, it's very hard to draw a circle perfectly. But what you can do is you can find the top of something, the bottom of something, the left of something, the right of something. So you see how it turns into a stop sign like that? Already it's becoming, I've only used straight lines, and yet this, this straight object over here, the straight line object, is becoming circular. So now I'll put in another line, another line. And the more lines that I put in, the more round it becomes. And so that is actually another Greek idea, 
that a circle is actually an infinite number of lines. And now look at that. I have like almost a perfect, you know, it's not a perfect circle. It's a very <laughs> flawed circle. But I mean, it's something that's becoming really convincingly circular. And it's much better than my freehand version right here. So I call that stop signing. So I'll use that right here on the faces where I'll stop sign in all the different features. Um, I'll go in with multiple straight lines and that helps me to find things that are like pretty circular. So again, um, as you work on your own drawings, um, don't ever feel the pressure to be too formulaic about these things. Um, as you work on your drawings, you can see the curve with like one curve if you want to. I'm just giving you a way of working. So I'm gonna jump over here again and let you take a look at that right there. And now I'm back to, let's say the back of Jesus' shoulder. Um, if I draw a line from the top of the eyebrows, I, got, I landed that wrong. The top of the eyebrow over, that's where his shoulder is. So I'm gonna go over here. Okay, his shoulder is all the way up here, way, way, way above the line of the top of his eyebrow. And that kind of gives him his gesture. Right here. And then there is Mary's arm coming out to the side right here. Uh, sorry, her hand coming out to the side. So you could say, oh, this is incredibly complicated. Um, I'll upload the picture of this to the website. Um, so that you guys can follow along and produce the drawing in greater detail. Uh, what's exciting for me is when I was younger, I'll just be very honest in that I didn't have access to like real, um, like solid art instruction that would allow me to do like, let's say a master copy of Rubens as I'm doing with you guys right now. Uh, it's why I'm so happy to pass it along because I think of you guys in a way almost as being like similar to me when I was a boy. And artists all through the centuries, you could say, well, I like to create my own artwork. I don't like to copy anyone else's. That's a really good thing. But I think every artist should be copying masterworks by previous artists. Because previous artists, um, it's, it kind of goes back to that whole idea. Um, it was said by Isaac Newton, but it was also said by many people before Isaac Newton. Um, Bernard of Chart said it first. Um, if I see further, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants who came before me. And that's exactly the case with art, in my opinion. If you want to see further, really admire and listen to and enjoy um, and watch the great artists, musicians, the people that came before you. And then as you digest their work, maybe copy their work, um, then you're gonna see further. You can stand on the shoulders of giants who came before you, which I think is really cool. And okay, we're getting more of the specifics here. And a cool thing about Rubens is he did a great job with hair. <laughs> um, he loved to sketch in these flowing curls in all of his work. It's actually how you can pick out a Rubens painting. Um, Van Dyck would also do it as well, his student, where he would have these curling, flowing lines and it almost looked like water, um, the way that the beards would like flow. And maybe he got that all from himself, but maybe he was influenced by another artist whose work had this quality, Leonardo da Vinci. And while I'm talking about all of the different artists who you know inherited things. Leonardo da Vinci, he got his flowing graceful lines. He was probably heavily influenced by his teacher, who was the sculptor and painter, but a better sculptor, Verrocchio. So Verrocchio was Leonardo da Vinci's teacher. And Verrocchio's paintings all had this really cool swirling line to like the hair and to the beard. 
And again, we'll look over at that really awesome swirling line. Like, check that out. I just think that's so amazing, all those swirls. Like the swirl of the mustache. And so right here, we're going to get the swirl of the mustache right here. And now it curls over, just like so. And okay, so we're getting things locked in. Um, you know, we could spend hours just like right here, right? Um, but it's useful to do quick sketches of things. It's not um, unuseful to like to jump into like quick sketches and to push them along a little bit um, and then to return to them later. So if you enjoyed today's lesson, what I would encourage you to do is get into the shading. Um, if you notice, I abbreviated Jesus' face right here uh, by putting a straight line in, but no baby has a straight line like that. That was just a, a quick summary. Babies have this fat, they have these fat cheeks right down here. And I know that because I have at home a two-year-old and she has the fattest chipmunk cheeks. And I just, I love like going up and just grabbing them and you, <laughs> they're just so beautiful. Um, so that little rounded cheek right there is so important. The, the nose of a baby is never as sharp as I made it here, but again, that's okay. What you can do is you have your, your lines that are more or less like placeholders, and then you can go in and you can round it out as you see Ruben's painting has done. And we, to show you just a moment of where the shading might go, so like right here, you'd have more shading on the far side of the face. Rubens was really, really delicate with his shading uh, for the simple reason that he wanted to emphasize the light that was emanating, you know, like the, the beautiful light that was seen in the middle of the nativity. Um, it's, Rubens is here, I think, in my opinion, he's taking artistic license, um, and he's taking something from the book of John, the Gospel of John, where it says, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And so when you look at Rubens' painting, there's actually a light emanating from the figure of the infant Jesus. And so I think he's using a visual metaphor for the spiritual significance of Jesus' statement. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born? King of the Jews. For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose 
went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. <laughs> 